We'll turn to Matthew chapter number 26. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 1. Matthew 26, 1, it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests, the scribes, the elders of the people, into the place, palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Lord, bless your word, anointed. This messenger, Father, just use me. Use the messenger in your holy name. Amen. You can be seated. The Passover is the most important feast day among the Jews, apart from the Day of Atonement. There'd be no Day of Atonement without the Passover. The Passover is the beginning of months for Israel. It's in the springtime. starts with the month that's called Abib. Abib is the ancient Hebrew name for the first month of the religious year, and it means a bursting forth. It is the coming forth. The name was changed to Nisan. Nisan is a, is a Babylonian type name. But remember that Abib is important in Hebrew because it is the beginning. It is the busting forth. It is the bringing forth of life. And the Passover, therefore, my dear friends, prefigures for us something very, very important. It helps us to understand what happened those last few days before the Lord Jesus went to the cross and died. Passover is the first feast day of the year. It is the redemption from Egypt by the blood of the Lamb. It's followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is followed by the Feast of First Fruits, which is also called the Feast of uh, the Week of the Passover. Then the Feast of Weeks, which is the Feast of Pentecost, follows that. And then Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, the seventh month, the tenth day of the month. Then Sukkoth. Sukkoth is the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's when Israel gathers together in little man-made uh, like tents. They have two more added to that, Purim which is the feast that recognizes uh, the deliverance of Israel from Haman, the Agagite, who tried to, to, tried to destroy all of Israel. And then Hanukkah. Hanukkah falls around our Christmas time, and it's the Feast of Lights, when the menorah, which is lit, and they recognize that that was a time when the Israel was spared, the, temp the temple was desecrated, and they wanted to rebuild it, they wanted to renew it, they wanted to reconsecrate it. They didn't have enough light, enough oil to do the job, and God calls that one night's oil to last for eight days. And so therefore, they had Hanukkah. When you look at Passover and leavened bread, first fruits, weeks of Pentecost, Yom Kippur, Sukkoth, what you're looking at is a timeline laid down for us for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's Passover starts it. That's the crucifixion. That's what you're reading about now. The crucifixion of Christ, the Lord's Supper, is directly associated with Passover. And that's when it started. And then you have what's called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That was that time when the church of God was being ordained. Then you have the Feast of Pentecost. Fifty days afterward... And that Feast of Pentecost represents the main gathering, the gathering of the main fruit of the Church of God. And then you have Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And that is the end of the harvest. That is the gleanings at the end of that period of time. And that's what we're in now. We are in the gleanings. We're in the time when it's being the, the last part is being gathered together. And then, and then Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur has to do with the second coming of Christ. For He will come again. And when he comes again, the people are going to see him. And he, my dear friend, is what Israel, he's the blessed one. He's the hope and desire of all the ages. He's the one that matters. And without the Lord Jesus, there is nothing whatsoever. Amen. But there's in here, you have the beginning of this. You have what's called the Feast of first fruits, And the Feast of first fruits is when after the Passover, these are the first ones, the first fruit that comes from the ground. And that, my dear friend, is what happens happened when the Lord Jesus arose from the dead. For the Bible says He became the first fruits of them that slept. 
What's that mean to me, preacher? That means that every one of us, if we're born again, we are members of the church of the firstborn, and we are the first fruits of the resurrection. Make no mistake about it, you will come forth. The Bible says the hour is coming when all that are in the graves shall hear the voice of the Son of God and come forth. Amen. Amen. At Pentecost, the Holy Ghost comes down. He comes in power. He anoints the church of the living God. You've got 16 different languages present that day. And the reason you do is because pilgrims have come from everywhere for the Passover and they're still in Jerusalem and still in that area. So the Word of God comes and every one of them hears in His own language the marvelous works of God. Important everywhere. All over the place, they have come to hear God's blessed word. Red, yellow, black, and white, they're all precious in His sight. The foot at Calvary is level ground. Amen. And so the Feast of Pentecost lays down the very foundation of what the church is all about. Here we are when everybody can come and hear God's eternal word. So this all started with the Passover. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He taketh it, my dear friends. He becomes the pass he becomes the scapegoat that God puts all the sins on and he carries them away. The Lord's Supper is the place that represents this or takes the Passover and uses it as a basis for the Lord's Supper. The Lord Jesus Christ went to Gethsemane in the last week before He died. Gethsemane is an olive press. Gethsemane is where the very life was squeezed out of His soul, of the Lord Jesus, of the man who walked amongst us. And the very life of Almighty God gave everything that He had from that moment on. For my dear friend, He said, My Father, not my will, but Thine be done. So there at Gethsemane, it was one Gethsemane was laid down. Gethsemane became the birthplace of all that we are as Christians. Gethsemane opened the door for Calvary. It prepared the Lord Jesus so that He could die upon the cross. My friend, the disciples at this time were hiding for fear of the Jews. My friend, they were hiding for fear of the Jews. They were hiding because of terror. They, they were hiding because they knew the Jews would do anything they possibly could to put down this new religion. Fear, my friend, is quite a motivation. The French Revolution had what's called the reign of terror. And my dear friend, we have what's called today this uh, cancel culture. It's creating fear in our country. People are afraid to say anything because these people, if you don't agree, if they don't agree with you, they will destroy you. Take everything you've got away from you. My dear friend, make no mistake about it. I'll be as plain as I know how. These are not fellow Americans. They're enemies. They are not Americans. They are enemies. When a man departs from the First Amendment, the freedom of speech, I no longer have anything to do with him whatsoever. They're religious leaders of this day, of this week when Christ was crucified. The Pharisee, the Sadducee, the chief priest, they had already hardened themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. They'd rejected Him in their soul. Listen to what it says in John 11 verse 48. If we let him alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take him away, and we shall and take away both our place and our nation. They were concerned far more about their physical presence on earth than they were about the spiritual condition of their people. In John eight forty one, this is what they said about the Lord Jesus. John eight forty one, he said, They said, You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, the Pharisee, the Sadducee, the the chief priests, they said this to Christ, We be not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. Did you hear that? They accused Him of being illegitimate. That makes it easy to reject somebody you demonize. He's illegitimate according to these people. Luke chapter number 11 and verse number 15. But some of them said, He cast us out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. In plain words, he is a witch or he's a wizard. He's, uh, he's, he's, a, he's an occultist. And what you see happen in Israel that appears to be miracles is nothing in the world more than the work of a demon-possessed man. That's what they said about him. In John chapter number 10 and verse number 20, And many of them said, He hath a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? They accused him of being demon-possessed. So it's awful easy to reject a man like that. 
Why would, why would you want to believe in a man who died on a cross, a martyr's death according to them, who was illegitimate, he was demon-possessed, he was an occultist, none of the people believed on him or the rulers they said, so why would you want to have anything to do with a man like that? That is what the religious leaders of his day had to say. They chose the devil over Christ. Matthew chapter 27 verse 16 says this, and they then had a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate saith unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. And when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priest and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whither of the twain will ye that I release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why, what evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. And the people said this. Then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us and on our children. And for 2,000 years the Jew has been driven from every country on earth. For 2,000 years he's been accused of every plague, every problem, of everything that ever happens to humanity. He gets the blame for it. And he's been called a Christ killer. He's been called a demonic. He's been, he's been accused of sacrificing children. He's been accused of dragging them off into the woods. Everything you can imagine, the Jew has been accused of. And Adolf Hitler, you know what he did? Six million Jews were perished under the hands of this monster in Germany. The Jews, therefore, have paid a terrible price when they said, let his blood be on us and on our children. They chose the devil over the Lord Jesus Christ. For the name Barabbas is a conjunction of two words, bar Abba, and Bar Abba means son of my father, son of his father. Barabbas was a demon possessed, murdering, thieving, uh, in a scoundrel that had tried to overthrow the legitimate government. Barabbas, though, was chosen by the people. Watch carefully, my dear friend. The mob chose Barabbas. The mob has rejected Christ. The mob will always be wrong. Don't ever follow the mob. When you get around a mob, you get around mob mentality. They're like a pack of uh, wild dogs. The mob will go after you and destroy you because they don't think the way they do when they're alone. This is the mob mentality that said, Crucify him! Put him to death! And so they did scream for his death and for his blood. I want you to notice two things though. Two special things. In verse number 18, Matthew chapter 27, For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. This is Pontius Pilate. Pilate knew who these people were. He knew all about them. He knew that if he may not have understood their religion, Pilate might not have been a scholar of the Torah and all of that, but he didn't need to be. He knew human nature. And he knew these people were nothing but a bunch of religious backstabbing hypocrites. And he said he knew for envy they delivered him. But don't you look at something else in here. And that's Pilate's wife. This is quite a thing. Matthew chapter number 27 and verse number 19. Matthew chapter 27 verse 19. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. God comes to Pilate's wife. God tells Pilate's wife, you don't have to be accountable for this. You can back out of it. You can reject it. Say, wait a minute, preacher. 
Didn't the Lord Jesus Christ say to Pontius, didn't He say to Peter, listen carefully now, when He told them that He must be delivered into the hands of the Romans and be crucified, and Peter said, Not so, Lord! And the Lord Jesus Christ looked at Peter and said, Get thee hence, Satan. Thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Why on one hand, why on one hand, would He, uh, would he rebuke Peter for trying to stop him from being crucified? On one hand. But on the other hand, here is a woman, a pagan, that is being warned to have no part of him being crucified. You go home this afternoon and think about that. Think about the hand of God in your life. Think about every thought that goes through your mind. Think about what you as an individual are accountable for. Think of the fact that the Holy Ghost came to a pagan, to Pilate's wife and told her, you don't have to have any part to do with this. The Lord Jesus said this. He said, it must be that the Scriptures fulfill. It must be that this happens. But woe unto that man by whom it happens. You'll make a choice before you walk out of this house today. You'll make a choice as a swine that has a pearl cast before it. And it is this pearl in the snout of a swine. And a pearl in the snout of a swine he will cast off and he will go to the slop. Or it may be that the holy that comes to you, the word of God, the truth that I'm giving you is like that that comes to a dog. The Bible says, cast not that which is holy to the dogs. You are either a swine, a dog, or a believer in Christ. Amen. I don't be mean. <laughs> don't make all of you mad. But I'm going to tell you something. You're going to make a choice this day. Every time you hear the Word of God, you make a choice. Every time. Every time. Not just Easter or any other day of the week or the year. When you hear the Word of God this morning and walk out that back door, you've made a choice. So that would be quite a message to preach about Pilate's wife, wouldn't it? So what did God the Father see when His Son was on the cross? God saw Him as the obedient servant. The Lord Jesus Christ was now living the life, the perfect life, and the end of that life was to give Himself under the Father's will. That's what the Son of God did. He also saw Him as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. This is important. When the Bible says that the Lord Jesus took away the sin of the world, it meant that the Lord Jesus Christ took away the guilt of all mankind. The whole collective guilt of every, every person on this earth. He took it away. What's going on, preacher? It's God dealing with sin. He saw Him as the greatest expression of His love. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. All of this was planned before the foundation of the world. Have you ever got alone and asked yourself a question, why does it continue? Have you ever asked yourself this question, if God knew this was going to happen, why did He let it happen? Have you ever asked yourself the question, why does it continue on? I see no improvement in anything. Why the billions upon billions are born generation after generation after generation? Have you asked yourself that question? There's an answer to that question. He made Him to be sin for us. Hebrews chapter 5. In Hebrews chapter number 5, the sin that the Lord Jesus Christ became was so wretched upon His soul, such a weight upon His heart, there's no way in the world that any human being could stand it. So the Lord Jesus Christ had to have the power of God in order to go through what He did. He bore and became the sin of the world. He made Him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin. Glory to God. I'll tell you something right now. Nobody else did that. There's nowhere else on this earth you can go where somebody died for your sin. And every one of us in this house today must say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I need help. And God will help you. That's why Christ died. His death was for a reason. Let me give you four things. First of all, God allowed it. God allowed this damnation. He allowed this death. He allowed this destruction to come into the world. But remember, before the foundation of the world, before it was ever made, before the first man ever breathed his breath, the Bible said he was the Lamb of God from the foundation of the world. The Lord Jesus was already chosen. First he allowed it. Secondly, he confronted it. When sin came into this world, the Lord Jesus Christ confronted it. 
He came to be, give himself a ransom for many. He came to die and he came to, he came to assault sin. Thirdly, he came to defeat it. And he did defeat it. The Bible said he made a show of it openly on the cross at Calvary. And then fourthly, he came to eliminate it. And that'll be the day, glory to God, when it's all gone. He allowed it to come into the world, God did. So that through all of this, you're going to learn something about God. Through all of life, through every experience of life, you're going to learn something. God's not an idol. He's not something chopped out and made by human hands. He's not something that we offer prayers to that can't do anything. He can't hear you, can't do it. He's the almighty, eternal, absolute being, the creator of the universe. And you've got a reason for being here this morning. Amen. God had a reason for all of this. And then there's the tomb. What about the tomb? Well, the tomb for dead people. The tomb. We live with, we have in this church is a rock's throw, folks, a rock. You can walk out here in the back and throw a rock and hit one of the biggest cemeteries in this town. It's right behind us. It is the necropolis. That's the Greek word for the city of the dead. And let me say something to you. I've been in that graveyard time and time and time and time again. And I've never seen a ghost walking up and down through the graveyard. I've never had to deal with a demon one time in that graveyard. Say, so why? Folks, there's nothing but bodies buried out there. Well, let me tell you what's buried in that graveyard. Memories, hearts, lives, souls, compassion, love. That's what's out there. If you've been to as many graves as I've been to and as many sermons as I've preached at graveside, you know that a human, 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 there's something about humanity. That, that shows itself at a grave. Just a few weeks ago, I was at a graveside, and a widow took a little box that had the remains of her husband. He was, he was, uh, his body was burned, uh, cremated. And she took that little box, and they set it on the ground, and she got down on her knees, and she kissed that little box. There's no way in the world that you can look at something like that and just walk away from it and it doesn't affect you. That affects you. Because you see, that's life. That's what life's about. Life comes and life goes. When you see something like that, you've got to look beyond it. There's got to be something better than this. There's got to be somebody bigger than this. Amen? There's got to be a reason for all of this. Your professors and your teachers and your scientists and all the rest of them have no reason. They have no answer. All they got is a bunch of questions. And fill your head full of doubt because they're full of doubt. But the Bible gives you an answer. Why seek you the living among the dead, they said. What are you doing in a graveyard for a living man? What do you mean? Well, he's not here. He's risen. He told you he'd rise from the dead. And yet the Bible said they didn't understand what that meant. You know why they didn't listen to him? He told them that he was going to rise from the dead. Destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. As Jonah was in the mouth of the whale, even so must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth and raise him up. He came forth from the dead. Why seek you the living among the dead? Demon-possessed people hang out around the dead. You know what that Bible says about the dead? It says that they had grave clothes. Grave clothes. When they brought the Lord Jesus, when they brought uh, 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 Lazarus forth from the dead, John chapter number eleven said, "Loose him and let him go." If you've been brought forth from the dead, if you've been born again, you've been brought forth from the dead. Take it off, loose him. You don't need grave clothes. He'll cover you with his righteousness. Take him off. He has no need for them anymore. There's nothing in the world that stinks any more than dead religion. Dead religion's formal religion, but there's no power in it. You sing the words, but there's no soul in it. There's no ability. There's nothing to be able to change somebody. You ought to be able to walk in here today and walk out of here today completely changed from what you used to be. Somebody said, well, that's only for certain people. Oh, no, no, no. He tasted death for every man. Well, preacher, God knows what I've done and he cannot forgive me for what I've done. You kidding? You tell me the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross cannot forgive you for anything, any sin whatsoever. Amen. You see, he told them this. He said, because I live, ye shall live also. 
And I want you to think with me for a minute. Think with me. The Lord Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity. Forever existing. Never was a time when he did not exist. Forever. The Son of God is eternal. But he came forth into this world and took a body. The body that his father made for him. Amen. That body that he lived in on this earth was capable of death. For he had to die. God cannot die. That's an impossibility. So at the cross his body died. His spirit was gone. His soul, he said, Peter did in Acts 2, will not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. He went into, into the soul went down and announced the victory. Abraham, I'm here. Moses, Elijah, here I am. And there's no doubt some shouting in glory. But listen carefully. When he rose from the dead, he rose from the dead. Spirit and soul all merged together now back into that body. The body stayed in the tomb, folks. body didn't go anywhere. body's in the tomb for three days. But his soul and his spirit unites in that body. All right? Now he's living in a body that cannot die. That body has died and will never die. And the Bible calls him the last Adam, the second man. So what do you mean, preacher? I was begotten of the first Adam, John, Romans 5. And because I was begotten of the first Adam, I'm going to die one day. But I've been begotten of the last Adam. And because I've been begotten of the last Adam, listen carefully now, I'll get the same life he had when he rose from the dead. Amen. Before that, he could die. Now, he's the first fruits of them that slept. Never die again. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. My old body of clay one day will give up the ghost. But I won't will live forever. That's what this is about, folks. Easter is about the resurrection of Christ. If Christ be not risen, our faith is in vain. It's just a lot of noise about nothing. I mean, we can make noise. People are good at making noise, but what's that going to do for you? If Christ be not risen from the dead. But now is Christ risen. And it become the first fruits of them that slept. So, why should we, my dear friend... Why should we let this world beat us to death and drag us down? And the thing that the world, most of them out there are afraid of the most is death. Because they're unprepared for it. But he said, he that liveth in me shall never die. Hallelujah. For the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. I'll close with this. After eight days, again, his disciples were within. And Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, How did he do that? See, his resurrection body. The doors are shut. He appears in the midst of them. Peace be unto you, then saith he to Thomas. And I love Thomas. Everybody loves Thomas. I don't have any problem with Thomas. Why, good night, I've doubted this and doubted that and doubted and doubted and doubted. So, well, you're a great man of faith. No, I believe in the Lord Jesus, and every once in a while he'll help my faith. <laughs> then he saith to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. That's all it took. You living? Hallelujah. 1973, I started living. I'll live forever. Are you alive? Praise God. Amen. Well, I'm a religious preacher. Well, I want to get you out of your religion, and I want you to get you to Christ. Amen. Get you to the Lord. Father, I pray you take what I've said this morning. Help somebody with it. I've given forth the word. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. There's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. But the precious name of Christ, he is the only savior of mankind. In Jesus' name.